The Bible says, examine yourselves. That doesn't mean that I should examine somebody else. It's a bad, bad sign when I examine everybody else. Shows that I haven't seen myself. I have lost sight of my own great need. You know, that's the mark of a true Christian. He examines himself in the presence of God, and he judges no man. Jesus was like that. But it would be good, and it is good, and it must be good for us to examine ourselves or to let God examine us. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, whether Christ be in you. I've been sitting here praying for this one thing, that God might help in these days for us to see our great need. What is our need? Well, we're a perishing lot, perishing. Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I'm in a poisonous atmosphere. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's no deliverance except the thing that our brother spoke of, to be made new, absolutely new. As long as we try to fix up the old, we'll only make an awful job out of it. But, oh, if Jesus Christ has his way, he'll go his way. We will go his way. And his way is just one way. Learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. Oh, is that my desire? Do I come to learn to play the fiddle or the bass fiddle? Why, when I come to this teacher... I had a teacher for two years who didn't know himself how to hold the fiddle and he was teaching me bad habits. And when he finally got too old to teach me any longer, I got another teacher. He said, play something for me. So I took my fiddle. Boy, he said, that's rotten. The first thing I had to do was to get another kind of a fiddle. He said, this fiddle's not for you. I had one that was made for a man, and I was just a little boy, you know, and I couldn't. He says, that's rotten. He made me start all over on new principles. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. And what does the Bible say? Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. A turning upside down. A beginning on a new foundation. Let this mind be in you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is my mind this morning? How am I minded? I'll soon find out. If I'm choking because of the atmosphere around about me and coughing and barking. Why, I haven't gotten down. I read of a place where there was a fire and many people died from suffocation, asphyxiation. The smoke choked them to death. And there were two, two or three that were saved alive. And I tell you how it happened. They knew what to do. When the smoke filled the whole building and they were up somewhere on the third floor, they got on their stomachs and they put their nose to the ground they had been informed that there was always a certain layer of air on the ground. The smoke rises, and whatever oxygen there is and whatever air there is drops to the bottom, and so they had enough air to sustain their lives and for them to get out and to save their lives and all the others with all their fuss, with all their fuming, they choked to death. And if I want to find the way of life, there's only one way. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Let this mind be in you. What is that mind? Why, Jesus wanted to humble himself. 
When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Well, we don't do that either. We're too cultured. But we get sour on the inside. We don't like it. Jesus liked it. He said, I delight to do thy will, O God. He condemned sin in the flesh. He said, no. He was tempted in all points, like we are, like Adam. Why, you shall be like God. We heard it quoted a while ago. Why, don't let them do that to you. How quickly Jesus Christ showed what mind was in him, what mind controlled him. Get thee behind me, Satan. Oh, to have that mind in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful monitor that will guide me in the right direction. It will guide me down where I find Jesus, where I breathe a heavenly atmosphere, and I'm not choked by the poisonous gases of pride and conceit and self-seeking and self-made spirituality. Beloved, there's no salvation. I tell you, there isn't any salvation. Our hearts are too deceitful. We become spiritually minded, and all the while we admire ourselves. My God, who shall deliver me from this Satan that now puts on the livery of heaven, that now is transformed into an apostle of life? How we praise ourselves, how we admire ourselves, simply because we have not been turned upside down. Our minds have not been transformed. We have not the mind that was also in Christ Jesus. How do I feel when I'm judged, when I'm misjudged? That's one thing the Lord had against me when I first came into Pentecost. He said, you're doing my will along every line except one. You don't like to be criticized. I didn't. God held that against me. Why, that's the mind of the flesh. Oh, beloved, the thing that will help us very, very greatly is to seek Jesus. And when we seek Jesus, we will soon get down. The Holy Ghost will see to it. The unction that you have received of the Holy One will teach you all things. Teaches you to keep your mouth shut. I always say it teaches you French. Ferme la bouche. It does. With a vengeance. Have you learned to keep your mouth shut? Have you learned to keep your heart with all diligence lest these thorns and thistles spring up? I found out that one can be very spiritual on the outside and still have a sour heart. And still have a root of bitterness in the heart. My, there was a time when I chafed under it. I couldn't deliver myself. I couldn't get out of it. It was choking me. The only thing to do was to get down. Really get down. And I mean get down. I had to go to people that had harmed me, that had hurt me, that had sinned against me, and humble myself before them. That did it. That helped. Oh, when that mind that is also in Christ Jesus controls me. Beloved, that's not my own mind. It's his mind. And Jesus Christ offers to think for me, to feel for me, to be my own life also. He that hateth not his own life also. Why, beloved, when we do that, we will welcome vicissitudes. We will welcome Someone has said we ought to consider the people that harm us and that do evil and ill to us. We ought to consider them our very best friends. It isn't praise that blesses me and lifts me, but blame. Blame is far better than praise, but until I like it. I had an experience one time when I was awakened to my great need of humility. I wish I had that awakening today. Oh, I chafed. I thought, my God, my God, my God. First, I cried to God to show me myself. I had learned that from another brother. In Kenosha, we had a habit of walking up and down and walking up and down praying, and he did. 
It was during the Depression when the men had no work, and so they spent eight hours a day in prayer and sometimes 12 hours. Didn't do them any harm. And this young fellow's walking up and down. He said, oh, God, show me my abominable self, my Lord. Show me my abominable self. I took that up, and I began to pray like that. But, oh, my, did you ever pray like that? You know, you'll get to the place where you think everybody has wings and you have horns. The strangest thing what happens when you really want to know the truth. When you really want to know the truth and you realize that you're dying, you're choking to death. You begin to pray like that and I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed for many years. And oh, the vision that God gave me at that time, the awful, awful condition. Why, that is salvation when we realize how deceitful above all things and desperately wicked our own hearts are. Why, it was Adam and Eve that were deceived by that angel of light, Lucifer. Ye shall be as God. Isn't that a wonderful ambition? Why, today it's being preached in Pentecost from one end of the earth to the other. Why, you shall be as God. You can buy phonograph records. They come from California, and they'll tell you who you are. Why, you don't know. You're sons of God. You are. You ought to have your pockets full of money. You ought to stick out your chest. You ought to tell the devil where to get off at. Beloved, it's that same poison of Lucifer and it's not surprising because the devil knows his time is short. And if God Almighty can get his people down with a transformed mind, with the renewal of the mind, when Jesus Christ can possess the minds of his people, then Satan will be in the pit. That's where Satan reigns, in the church. That's where the man of sin spreads himself, in the church, in the place where it ought to be Christ and Christ alone. And if it isn't Christ alone, I will never meet the great. I will never find that throne room of heaven. And where am I? Am I on the way? Well, I ought to examine myself. I will soon find out. How do I like it? When things, when people do outrageously mean things. It was at that time that God allowed people to do that to me. I chafed under it. I wanted to forgive, and I did the best I knew how, but there was something in my heart that rose up within me. And one time when one man railed on me, I rose up against it. I didn't rail back. I knew better than that. I knew I'd only get it worse. But in my heart, there was something. There was something created I knew that was poison. I knew it was thorns and thistles. God says, you can't get into the kingdom. They that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you shall prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is that? Why, if any among you seems to be great or wants to be great, let him be the lowest of all. I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. I've washed your feet. Blessed are ye if you do those things. And so I had to learn my lesson. And I remember how desperately I prayed. And one day, like Brother Gardner said the other day, the Lord checked me and said, Look out, it's coming. Sure enough, it came again that day. But oh, the transformation God had wrought in my soul. The more they railed on me, the more I rejoiced. Inwardly, I was just laughing. It was like honey out of the rock. I knew that wasn't myself. I knew that I could never have done it up to that time. I would get inwardly very wild and mad. And now so sweet, so loving. And the more they railed, the more I rejoiced. And glory to God, I knew God was answering prayer. God was transforming me 
Praise God, my mind was gone and the mind of Christ was beginning to possess me. What does he mean when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God has a kingdom prepared before the foundation of the world, but he has no takers. That kingdom is not going to be given to the old Adam nor to his son, but to the last Adam who is made the Lord from heaven, who said, all things are delivered unto me of my father. And he says, now come, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, we think of the glory of heaven and how we're going to be transformed into the same image from glory to glory. But we don't realize that that glory of the only begotten of the Father was full of grace and truth. It was his humility that constituted his glory, his lowliness, his utter meekness. Not my will, but Thy will be done. That's where the Father was glorified in the Son. That's where the veil was rent and the way was open for you and for me to become sons of God. Learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of me. If we're wise at all, beloved, we're going to do one thing alone. I do one thing alone. And wholly give myself to one who gives himself to me. Ter Sagan wrote that song. Where is the school for one and all where men become as children small and little ones are great? Where to unlearn all things I learn from self and from all others turn. One master hear and see. I learn to do one thing alone. One thing alone and wholly give myself to one who gives himself to me. And you know that transforms every, every little thing in life into a throne room where I meet my king. We heard a while ago about the kitchen sink. How wonderful when that kitchen sink becomes a meeting place with God. Every item in all the world becomes a throne where I bow before the king, where I humble myself before the king. And our sister talked about the sink, how it became a throne room. I remember in a faith home, a dear sister who sought God with all her heart and how that when she had fasted five days, one day she came down into the kitchen, and you know some of the saints don't like to wash dishes. And here was a pile of dishes, and she had, she had fasted, she hadn't eaten for five days. And when she saw that pile of dishes, what did she do? Go into a dump and say, where are all these lazy saints? They eat like butchers three times a day, and here I've been fasting and waiting on my Lord. For five days, where are these lazy creatures? And then roll up her sleep. No, sweetly singing, she did the dishes. Never letting on at all. I tell you, that sink became a throne room of the king. I knew another thing, the young girl, see? She never liked to do dishes unless George was helping her. My, what a sanctuary that kitchen sink became. How different it was now. Why, that was the Lord. Why, sure. Otherwise, she didn't like it at all, but my goodness. You know, marriages are made in heaven. But often the sink is uh, sort, of a, sort of a way to heaven. <laughs> my how marvelous oh how wonderful because you come to me hold the force the knives are coming spoons are on the way <laughs> oh yes that was the Lord I tell you that was the Lord high and holy 
Glory to God. <laughs> and so they went to the altar. <laughs> Saying, because you come to me with not save love. Oh, beloved, these hearts of ours are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? But when I am minded like Jesus Christ was minded, I'll be on the way. I'll not deviate. I will not seek myself, nor the things that satisfy the flesh, and then blame the Lord and blame all the holy angels in heaven for having led me that way. But I will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That will be my guide. It will be the cross of Christ. Oh, Jesus, show me the way. Well, it says, follow me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, beloved, to get down, to humble myself, to really be transformed by the renewing of my mind, to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's it. It isn't the way the gale blows, but it's the way the sail is set that determines the way she goes. And when my sail is set in the right direction, oh, Jesus, this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, my Father, when I learn to get down Really get down and really humble myself. I will find the way like those three in that house full of smoke and full of fire. They got down. They found out that along the ground there was a certain layer of air and they got out alive and all the others spoke to them. Oh, let me learn my lesson to really be transformed by the renewing of my mind that I may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Man told me how God dealt with him about his ministry. He found a lot of things that he didn't understand in this minister, but one night he had a dream or a vision in which he saw this minister in charge of a large store, a store in which a lot of Things were sold that were good to eat. Even candy, chocolate candy. And he saw this minister in charge of this store and sampling everything. And he got kind of jealous of the minister because this minister dug into the chocolate candy and uh, had a taste of everything that he was selling. Everything that the customers... Well, what's good for me is good for the assembly. And what's good for the assembly is good for me. Praise the Lord. The husbandman that laboreth must first partake of the fruit. But the thing that impresses me in this verse is this, that the Apostle Paul sets himself forth as an example. A minister who's not an example is not a very good minister. He must first partake of the fruits. Any man who dares preach something that he hasn't experienced himself is going to fall flat. His ministry is not going to be effective. It is when Jesus Christ has made you an epistle of Christ and has written the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus into your very bones that the word of the Lord will come forth with authority and with power. And that's the thing we ought to pray for when we pray for our ministers. We should pray for them more than we do. Because what the minister is, we're going to be. And if God could raise a ministry that's much more spiritual than those we have now, why, we most likely will have better food to eat. We most likely will become more spiritual, like priests, like people. And thank God for the Apostle Paul. He says, we are the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. In another place he said, who is sufficient for these things? My, how many times I said, my father, 
Why did you ever put me into the ministry? I didn't ask for it. I'm scared. I'm scared. God, it's your responsibility. You know who you picked up. But you know that very fearfulness makes you wait upon the Lord for instruction and for guidance. And a man that doesn't walk in fear is not fit for the ministry. A man who is not so fearful of failing God that he sees his need constantly of depending on the Holy Ghost. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves even to think anything as of ourselves, but oh, how very wonderful when your sufficiency is of God. When it is God, glory to God, that creates within your soul a certainty, an assurance. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able. I have committed everything to God and everything I expect from the Lord. And now it says here something about judging. I don't suppose anybody is more judged than a minister, more criticized than a minister. That's the one thing God held against me when I came into the ministry. He says, I don't hold anything against you except this one thing. You don't like to be criticized. Why, I knew that I was all the Lord's and that my every moment was spent serving the Lord and I thought everybody would know it. I couldn't understand how people couldn't see that I was doing my best. They didn't. They suspected me one time of pilfering the missionary offerings because we needed a clock in our earliest mission. And I had some money coming to me, which I had earned in the jewelry business, and it came back to me. So I went and bought a clock and put it on the wall. And you know, these Miriams, they got together in this corner that morning. The other corner. Did you see that clock? One of them said, I lost all my confidence in Brother Walt. And then after a while, one woman was kind enough to bring it to me. Then I got them together, made them pay for it. Then they felt better. Praise the Lord. But you know, today it's different. When people criticize me, they say, well, how can they help it? How can they know? They, they don't know. You can criticize a, a bird for flying. But you better wait until you can fly. And then you can criticize it. But how can they help it? Why, they can't unless they walk the same way that you walk. But I found out that by going ahead in the name of the Lord and making sure that the Lord judges me and that my first job is not to please men. I must please men, yes. But my first business is to make sure that I please my God and that I do his will. And if I do that, I find out that I'll be opposed on every step of the way. A thief will always suspect somebody else of being dishonest. Did you find that out? If you want to know a person's fault, let him do the talking. See what they say about other people. That's what they are. We always judge others by our own glasses, by our own standards. If you're honest, you expect everybody else to be honest. If you're pure, you don't suspect others of impurity. And even when, you're ca when they're caught red-handed, you're still very slow. You don't judge. It's a wonderful thing to walk with God. And a minister's job is to walk with the Lord. That's his privilege, to walk with God. Let others learn their lesson if they will. And many people don't learn their lesson any other way. I know that in this work, God has striven to set up an example of a Holy Ghost ministry that lives by faith. And we've seen such miracles, marvelous miracles. You try to have a work like this without an organization and have every avenue, every part of it well supplied. We had ministers here 
from the assemblies of God who are chief men, they're leaders. We have ministers here from the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church, and they've looked at this work, and they said, we can't understand how this thing can function without sending out mimeographed requests for money, without any drive for money. How does it happen? How does it work? Well, it's because we strive to do what the Bible says, to live the life before God, to live in the sanctuary, his priest I am, before him day and night within his holy place, and death and life, and both things dark and bright I spread before his face, rejoicing with his joy, yet ever still, for silence is my song, my work to do, his blessed will, all day and all night long, forever holding with him converse sweet yet silent, for my gladness is complete. And why is it that the Apostle Paul was set forth as it were appointed to death, being defamed, being reviled, being misunderstood, being criticized, being judged, by the saints, let alone what the world did. They stoned him from city to city, imprisoned him, tried to kill him again and again. And all these things the Apostle Paul suffered. I tell you why. He had to. He wouldn't have gotten any place. The church of Jesus Christ would not have gotten any place if God hadn't given to them a champion that was willing to lay down his life to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to do the will of God as he appointed it for him. And that's the example God has been trying to raise in this work. Oh, to have a ministry. I'm so thankful to see in Germany a number of young men getting the light. How do they get it? Not from me. It's the Holy Ghost that has to do all these things. The Holy Ghost will use you, make you an example. Glory to God. He'll let you suffer. He'll let you die daily. But as you do, as you surrender to Jesus, don't regard the criticism and the judgments of men who don't understand. Regard only the command of God and the will of God. And you can't take time to explain everything. People wouldn't understand it anyway. But the result will be that the life of Jesus will take over. The life of Jesus Christ will take over. And people will get the light. And they'll see, oh, it was the Lord after all. It was God. Today the whole world recognizes that it was God in Paul. But we have a photograph here of Paul in his day. Not the kind of photographs that we publish today. I saw the photographs of a row of ministers the other day, and I thought, my goodness, how can a minister be such a monkey going into a photo establishment that now, all right, now, turn your nose this way, and your ear a little bit up, <laughs> and then smile with one eye. It's a regular monkey show. The Apostle Paul says, the off-scouring of all things unto this day defamed, criticized, judged, okay. When the First World War broke out, I remember how in one day 14 nations declared war on Germany, and so they issued a, an, a proclamation. Come on, folks, we're, we're ready to receive more declarations of war. Paul was ready for anything. You'll be ready for anything. If I have God for my friend, all hell cannot overcome. And that's my business. That's what he has chosen me for. We are ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The same mysteries that Jesus Christ offered the world and was crucified for. And he says, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, oh, beloved, what an honor, what a great honor to suffer a little bit for Jesus Unless I receive it as an honor, I'm not fit for the ministry. Oh, God alone can make ministers. God alone can. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, Jesus Christ. 
and you've ordained me and you have enslaved me to yourself as a bond slave of love you have pierced my ear I come to do thy will O God Jesus Christ says in my heart when he ordains me to be a branch in the vine oh for such a ministry and don't think that I'm talking like that to say that I'm like this but I'd like to inspire us to pray for that kind of a ministry. We need, we need men that are unflinchingly given to do the will of God. Paul was like that. What an example. What a marvelous example. Look at his writings. They're little fragmentary sentences here and there. And yet, in all of them, we have a wonderful picture of a man that is a friend of God, wholly dedicated, faithful unto death. And that's why the life of Jesus had a channel. That's what you and I are to be, channels only. Blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, you can use us every day and every hour. And now it talks about criticism. And he warns the Corinthians. Did you notice that? As my beloved sons, I warn you. He says, I know that grievous wolves shall enter in among you. And I know that you who have rejected me, when some false apostle come along, you're going to receive him. They will. They'll fall for him. Paul knew the flesh, but he says, I warn you, my beloved sons, I as a wise master builder have laid the foundation, O oh God. It makes my soul to tremble just to think of these things. And when he says, you criticize me, that's a very small thing. I don't mind. Go ahead. It's good for me. But there's a judge before whom I tremble. We know the terror of the Lord. Oh, would to God he could impress us with the terror of the Lord. He says in one place, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. We're constantly in touch with people who are called to be ministers in some capacity, maybe not to preach, but to do something for God. All of us have received a talent or ten pounds from the Lord. Something that God has given to us that we might serve the living and the true God. Listen, it is woe if I bury that talent in the ground. It is woe if I'm not faithful unto death. And yet there are so many powers of the flesh that keep us from fulfilling in God. It was my light right away, as soon as God had really saved me. I didn't want to preach. I had no thought of it. But I knew that I could pray. The Holy Ghost had come to me, and I knew that was my job. Prayer. I did it, too. I prayed without ceasing. All my spare time I devoted to, or most of it, I devoted to the act of Praying. I prayed more for my dead church than the ministers did. I had to. God had given me a spirit of prayer. He had given me the love of God. I suffered continually in my heart because these people were not saved. And while I didn't see much result at that time, today I see great results have come forth. <laughs> But woe is me if I hadn't been faithful. As I've often said, I was a boy. And all the temptations that come to a young man came to me. And all the ambitions. But here was one call. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. What has Jesus Christ chosen you for? Beloved, I feel strongly that we ought to have the gifts of the Holy Ghost manifested among us. He purchased gifts, but why don't we have them? God can't trust us with them. I told recently 
how I knew a man who had received real gifts of the Holy Ghost. God blessed him like that. God filled him. God used him in such a way that it was out of this world. And I had been instrumental in helping him. And I told him at that time that he was conceited and he was in danger. He didn't take it. But today he's my enemy because he got so conceited that God was through from him. And now he's trying to put on a powerful show himself. That's why God cannot bestow gifts upon us. As soon as we have a little gift, well, you watch these prophets. Watch these apostles. They put a feather in their hat and they stalk through the land and they are somebody now. And presently they want to start their own work and their own organization. And if you don't come to me, you don't get to heaven. They say that in Germany and you're not going to be in a rapture unless I make you eligible and so on and so on and so on. Why, it's the devil transformed into an angel of light. And yet, we ought to have the gifts of the Holy Ghost manifested among us. What has God called you? You'll never find it out until you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And we're not going to understand any of these chapters in Corinthians unless we take the key. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what does that mean? Why, I give him my sin. I give him my flesh. I give him my bondage. I give him my body, my soul and my spirit. And he takes it and he gives me in return his own divine nature, his humility, his purity. He has made unto us righteousness, sanctification and redemption, fellowship, Gütergemeinschaft. He that was rich became poor. But you know, we don't work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We do as much as is comfortable. And when it isn't comfortable, then we cease. Oh, to be altogether Christ's, to recognize that I don't belong to myself anymore. I don't. I have no right for any decisions on my part, any plans, any ambition, any hope. I belong to Jesus Christ, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. These things don't come to us unless we actually act upon it. Unless we actually. That's why the Apostle Paul speaks so strongly. Ye are Christ's. Oh, that's the wonder of it. Ye are Christ's. And he tells us what the result will be. We are Christ's. Why then, there will be the outflow of the rivers of life. But here he's talking to babes. He says, I've got to talk to you as to children. You're not able. Oh, we ought to be able to receive some strong meat, but we might not like it. We might not be able to digest it. I've seen people get up mad as hops and run from the meeting because they got hit. Why, we ought to enjoy it. He that judgeth me is the Lord. Thank God. Walking in the presence of God. Walking in the light as he is in the light. Every truly baptized soul that walks with God has the Holy Ghost within them like a great sun of righteousness, illuminating every part of your being. Nothing is hidden from the heat thereof and from the light thereof. Oh, God, be praised for the Holy Ghost. What a teacher. Glory to God. I judge not myself. You don't have to judge yourself. I feel sorry for these people that have to go to confession. And they'll call good evil and evil good. They'll confess things that are not sinful at all in the sight of God. And the things that are really sin. I listened to a holiness preacher, a woman. She really preached like a house of fire. And she would point at you. If you had any yellow in your glasses... Glass frame. Or if you dared have a pen that was yellow, you went straight to hell. 
to a devil's hell. And I tell you, she had real unction in her preaching. But she didn't see the spiritual pride that possessed her. These little things were hell-born sins. She told how that as a child she had stolen a penny. And it came to her mind, no, she had stolen a penny when she was a child. So she hunted up the party she stole it from. And she says it took a long, long time before she was got up enough courage to return that penny. What a sin. Mind you, a penny with an Indian head on one side. And God we trust on the other. And she had stolen a penny. And she was preaching really in real unction, my and she said, you know, if I hadn't returned that penny, I would have gone into a devil's hell to roast for all eternity. But she didn't see the Luciferian pride that possessed her. She had no sense of that at all. Beloved, it's a wonderful thing when the Lord judges us. Hallelujah. Walking in the light as he is in the light, he won't let a thing go by. The thing that really displeases him, walking in the light, darkness is exposed, is defeated. That's what I need. God said to Abraham, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. That's the first job of a minister, to walk with God like that. Oh, how I need that light, that light. And that's where the two-edged sword comes from. And that's the way God ordains his ministers. We don't spend enough time in the presence of the Lord. We don't break through the clouds and through the fogs until we actually bathe in the sunlight of his presence. And yet that's the place, the only place of safety for a minister. He that judges me is the Lord. Glory to God. He takes over. He that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. I often think of that kid in Switzerland when they should have written an essay on the dog. The teacher gave them that job. Describe your father's dog. His height, his tail, his color, his ears. Little Hans came without the essay, but he brought his dog with him. He says, I'll let the teacher look at him himself. <laughs> and that's what I do. I bring my dog with me. Let God look him over himself. <laughs> That's the best cure. Glory to God. The only cure. But he says another thing that before I sit down, I'd like to call your attention to. Judge nothing. What a wonderful thing. My, what a relief. What a relief when all that care for other souls is taken from me. Judge nothing. Do you know that we, we cannot judge others? We don't know how. Maybe somebody that seems very faulty to me is much dearer to God than I am. Only God can judge. And when I, when I expose myself to the light of the Holy Ghost, I will soon lose all courage to judge others. I'll find out how very weak and infirm and unable and unfit and unworthy, I am. And if I see a fault in someone else, I know that what they need is what I need. And what God provides for them is what he has provided for me, Jesus. But I think this is very encouraging. When the Lord comes to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart, Every man shall have praise of God. Jesus always finds something to praise. Not only that, but many times in people whom he has really chosen, he hides their true worth under a lot of faults. And outwardly they look crude and sometimes they look uh, very unkempt and uh, unfinished. But oh, inwardly God has his work. There's love and joy and peace and long suffering. There's real love for Jesus Christ. 
And we ought to be very, very, very careful not to judge. We're so apt to judge others. People in other churches, the Lord has said we talk about the dead churches without much Holy Ghost love. But you know they're going to surprise us in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of those saints are going to shine like the sun. And, oh, it's such a good thing not to judge before the time. Until the Lord comes. And the Lord will have praise for every man. Glory to God. How would you like to be transparent so that nothing of yourself would appear anywhere, but only Jesus Christ with his divine attributes would shine forth from within you? That's what you are if you're a real follower of Jesus Christ or... That's what you will be if he has his way with you. Ye are the epistle of Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, and there's no substitute for it. When I was working as a jeweler, I found out that there were many substitutes for gold, and that many people could be fooled by these substitutes. But after a while, I couldn't be fooled anymore because I recognized the value and the power, the strength of real gold. There was one sure test, and that was the test of acid and of fire. We had a man working in our shop who tried to make a lot of money on the side. And when I was an apprentice, he used to bring me his jewelry and ask me to work at it. To make it ready for a sale so that he could make more money. One time he brought me a gold brooch and he wanted me to solder a something on it. And my, it felt like solid gold. It was heavy. And it shone like gold. The minute, the minute I put it into the fire it melted. It was filled with lead. It couldn't stand the test of fire. And I thought, how many, many Christians are like that. They have a profession that shines like gold. They talk about it. We can preach about it. The Apostle Paul said, Lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He took care of his own life and of his own ministry, that it was real. And, beloved, it must be real, and it can be real, and it will be real when I delight myself in the Lord alone, and when I learn that one grand doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, ye have been the slaves of sin, the Apostle Paul says. That's ended. That's finished. Ye were the servants of sin, and that's true of all humanity. We were born in chains, in slavery. David never became a man after God's own heart until he discovered the corruption within. On the outside, ornaments. On the outside, a beautiful kingly armor and a kingly crown on his head. And he had won many victories through the power of God. He had really reason to be proud of himself. And he was until that pride was shown up by fire, and he discovered corruption in the depth of his spirit. And he said, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, Thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part shalt thou make me to know wisdom. It took not the trials. My David went through many, many trials until he despaired of life, but it took more than that. It took a tenth that he wasn't ready for. When he had won all these victories and he didn't have to go to war himself anymore, he sent Joab to win crowns for him and to besiege and overcome the enemy. And he took it easy at home. That's the place where the devil tripped him up. And that's the place where the enemy found corruption in his heart. And God had to discover it and God had to dig it out of him. And David was honest enough to confess his sin and to be cleansed of it. Oh, beloved, it's as we heard a while ago. 
affliction is good. I thank thee, Lord, that thou hast afflicted me. Now I know that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. And God says, as many as I love, I rebuke. That's the thing we don't like. We like to shine like gold. We like to be satisfied with a subterfuge, with a substitute, unless we really love the truth. And when we love the truth, we'll find the truth not in ourselves, but in our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And by that he means, I alone am the reality of God, the truth of God. He is made unto us of God, wisdom from God. That man that brought that brooch to me was not wise. My, he got so angry when I brought him his brooch back, all ruined, impossible to repair it. It was burned. And he was so angry because everything was lost. His profit was lost. He wasn't wise. If he had been wise, he would not have allowed that thing to come into his hands. He would not have paid the price for gold when he was getting lead instead of it. When he was getting a subterfuge. And you and I will not be satisfied with a subterfuge. Or with a substitute. We will not. We will search our own hearts by means of the acid test of the word of God. And by that fire that melts us the iron. Oh, thank God for the fire of the Holy Ghost. And we'll ask God, search me, O oh God, and try my heart, know me, and try my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And God won't test you if you refuse his rebuke and his reproof. He says, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Oh, is that what reproof is for? You want to remove this substitute, this lead that doesn't glorify God. You want to remove this inward corruption of mind and substitute for it. Here's the substitute. Here's the righteousness of the Son of God. Oh, that I might not have a righteousness of mine own, which is by the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. And what is that righteousness? That righteousness is Jesus Christ himself. It's his love. Oh, if I search my own heart and see how my love will not stand the test. Oh, it'll go a certain distance because we have learned to veneer ourselves, to put on a substitute for love. We know how to love, especially in meetings. We can make very sweet faces at one another. And sometimes in the heart, there is the gall of bitterness. Why not admit it? Why not say, search me, O oh God, and try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting and God will say, your tongues are a tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass unless they're backed up by the fire of my love. That you might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's what Jesus Christ is after. That's what the Holy Ghost is after. And we ought to be so thankful for the acid test of the word of God and the fire test of that word of God and of the Holy Ghost. You know, when you refuse the fire of the Holy Spirit and of the word of God, God will put you into a different crucible and he'll put you into a different fire. He'll let you be tested. He'll let some tribulation come upon you. When I was a very young Christian, God dealt with me about a certain matter in my life, about pride. I didn't know how proud I was. Until God exposed that thing and he threatened me. Mind you, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I've been greatly blessed in preaching the gospel. And God says, you're not humble like you ought to be. And if you don't get down, he threatened me with death. That was terrible. I said, well, this is a fine how do you do. 
I've been seeking God with all my heart. I've been praying for humility. And now God comes along and reproves me and says, I have not found your works perfect before my God. My God, I began to thank my Lord for exposing that inward fault of mine. I would never have gotten rid of it. You'll never get rid of it. You'll never receive gold tried in the fire as long as you hang on to your brand and to your substitute. But when you let go, the harlots and the publicans, it says, will enter into the kingdom of God before the Pharisees because they cloak themselves with a cloak of self-righteousness and they refuse the sentence of God concerning themselves. But the publicans and the sinners confessed that they were sinners and they repented of their sins. And God says, and they'll enter into the kingdom before you. Oh, what a grace is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that offers me the perfection of the Son of God. A new nature, a new creature. Glory to God. A love that never fails. Under all circumstances, it's always the love of God that always shines. And always lives for others. The mind of Jesus Christ. Oh, what kind of a mind is that? In comparison to my carnal mind, the carnal mind cannot be subject to the will of God. It may put on a coat of religiousness, but it doesn't stand the test. It will not humble itself. It will not consider everyone else says it in itself. For that purpose we need the mind of Jesus Christ, but think of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ to offer me his own mind, to offer me his own life, his own life. The question is only whether I want him. And that's the question we settle when God reproves us, when he rebukes us, when his word cuts, when it becomes the discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of our heart. And you know, that's a process that only God can apply. But he will, if I humble myself, if I come down before my God, if I acknowledge the truth of God, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Therefore, God sendeth them strong delusion, that they all might be damned who believe the lie. How many people believe a lie today? I know that people think that we are harsh when we talk about a lot of these revivals that are going on today. You know how easy it is to fill in Europe, to fill a tent seating thousands of people. All you have to do is talk about signs and wonders and people will come. Talk and offer them the baptism in the Holy Ghost and if, even if they don't get anything, as long as they seek and come, they're satisfied. But preach the truth and see how they'll run. It happened in California. There was a young man whom God seemed to endow with the gift of discernment. And the man who was praying for the sick had a long queue waiting for him. He prayed for one. He prayed for another. And he prayed for another. And then this young man came along. And he talked to one of these in the queue. And he exposed his secret sin. And when he was through, the queue was gone. They were all gone. They were all scared. Scared stiff that they might be exposed. Uh oh. They didn't want to get rid of the corruption. Oh no. Who in the world wants to get rid of his inward corruption? And I've seen Almighty God speak to heart and people got angry. I'm not like that. In other words, we want to appear righteous. We don't care whether we are righteous or not. But blessed are they that hunger and thirst. After righteousness, they shall be filled with reality. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Beloved, the gospel is still going forth into all the world, not primarily to heal the sick, but to save souls, to transform lives, to deliver you from the bondage and slavery and corruption and defilement of sin. And whoever wants that, will not have to ask long for divine healing. It will come by itself. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. 
who healeth all thy diseases. But first of all, he wants that soul of mine to be healed. And glory to God, here is a medicine. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. The question is only whether I want to be cleansed. And if I really want to be cleansed from all sin, I will need that discerning of the word of God, of thoughts and intents of my heart. When we come to God, we are superficially cleansed. We receive him. The faith receives Jesus Christ. And then there comes that wonderful cleansing process. Where he says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How long is that cleansing process going to go on until we're fully displaced, until Jesus Christ has come and we're transparent, hallelujah. The devil comes and he finds nothing in me but the conquering hero, the Lord Jesus Christ, his love that never fails, his peace that passes all understanding has now come to reign within my heart and to keep my mind and my heart through Christ Jesus and the joy of the Lord that springs forth like a fountain of eternity. The question is whether I want it. And when I want it, I will do like the Apostle Paul. I will not consider myself perfect. He said, you consider yourselves perfect. Look at me. Do like I. I forget the things that are behind. I press toward the mark. Not as if I had already attained. The Bible says we are complete in him. Thank God. That means that Jesus Christ, the perfected son of God, has come to be our life. We're newborn babes. Like a newborn babe is, is complete. It's a complete human being. But now to grow up into him in all things. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we only grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Son of God when we walk with Him, and when we abide in Him, and abide under the unction. Oh, that's a wonderful process. Now we are complete in Him. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, because they walk not after the flesh. That's finished. And who finished it? Jesus Christ finished it for all of humanity. That's the wonder of Jesus. Faith, the secret of faith, is to believe that God is. And that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the secret of New Testament faith is not only to believe in God who created all things, but in God who redeems me. Hallelujah. He who created me is now my salvation, is now my redeemer. I cannot do it myself. That's why he undertook the job. Thank God. And that's why Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. What do you mean, Jesus? Where shall I believe in you? Well, he says, I've come to dwell within you, to live out my own life within you. That's the glorious mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when God commands us to repent and believe the gospel, he says, forget yourself. Forget the things that are behind us. Now, let me go before. Let me be the one. Let me reign over your will and over your affection. Let me perfect you. Here's the New Testament 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. What a shepherd. You don't have to hang the 23rd Psalm on the wall. Let it be written in your heart. This great shepherd whom God brought again from the dead dwells within my very body to make me perfect in every good work to do his will. That's why I'm asked to believe in him. And that's why the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. God will not be pleased with me until he is pleased with Jesus Christ's image within me. Until looking upon me he sees Jesus Christ fulfilling in me that which is well-pleasing in his sight. That's what I need to believe. 
And there are people that have never been taught. You know, the Bible says that through the knowledge of him, we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Bible tells us that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Oh, to know thee. My whole earth's job is to get acquainted with Jesus. And how do I do that? Why, by looking unto him all the time. <laughs> Does he ever leave me? Does he ever forsake me? Does his promise ever fail? Does Jesus ever fail? Jesus never failed. And beloved, this doctrine is the doctrine that Paul preached. And it says, Thanks be unto God that ye were the slaves of sin. It's past. But ye have obeyed from the heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And what is that doctrine? Today there is a, a great polemic going on over doctrine. I was happy to see that a Catholic theologian at last, mind you, at last calls upon the Catholic Church to admit what murderers, holy butchers they were during the Middle Ages. It's high time that they admit what horrible tribulation they brought upon the world and upon the Church of Jesus Christ. And for the first time, to my knowledge, a Catholic theologian is calling upon the Catholic Church Get up and be honest and confess it. But that alone is not going to save them. That's not going to make them the church of Jesus Christ, beloved. Ye have obeyed from the heart. From the heart. That's what my heart is made for. It's made entirely for Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is made entirely for my heart. And ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And what is that form of doctrine? Well, he says to the Romans, you're still babes. I've got to talk to you in parables. Like ye yielded your members, servants of unrighteousness unto sin, recognize that Jesus Christ, who died unto sin once, has introduced you into his death. That you're dead. You're baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death. Reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. All oh, this wonderful life unto God. I don't have to wait until my body is laid into the grave to enjoy eternal life. I must enjoy it now. And the question is whether I want it. The Romans wanted it to obey from the heart. That form of doctrine, they put off the old man with his deeds. They put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that new man. That's the doctrine. Oh, how it has been brushed aside by the great bulk of Christians. But never mind. Jesus finds those who love the truth and are not satisfied with the substitute. And they're willing to go through the fire. They're the ones that are going to come through. They overpaid Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, not loving their lives. There's the test. The test will come to every true Christian, whether you will choose Jesus or your own life. Beloved, it will come if it hasn't come yet. And it will be a glorious choice that you make when you say, Savior, more than life to me, I am clinging, clinging close to thee. Why was it that the Israelites balked from going into the promised land? Because they loved their own life. God brought them up to that test. And when the spies came back and told of the giants and of the horrible dangers, they said, we're going to be a prey and our children, they balked. Because they loved their own lives. It was a test. And Moses said, in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God. I think there's a wonderful teaching there which maybe we're not ready to receive. But I've seen places where men were commanded to forsake all earthly help when they needed bodily healing. 
and to trust fully in the Lord. I know this thing cannot be taught successfully today because people think they can force God to heal them by throwing their medicine away. That isn't the way it happens. It's something that happens in your heart. From the heart, you know that Jesus Christ is your life and is the health of your body. But I've seen wonderful things happen to people like that. God's going to have a church without spot or wrinkle or any such a thing. That's what the Holy Ghost is working on. And in order to perfect the work world like that, he's using a terribly sharp sword. I tell you, he's performing an operation. He is cutting away the old flesh. Oh, God. And the longer we fast and fume, the longer will be the process. And we can't afford to do that. He says, arm yourselves. Reckon yourselves. Oh, Jesus. Live out thy life within me, oh, Jesus. King of kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings.